Good morning. Good morning. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. Will you stand with me as we sing our call to worship? Shout to the Lord. have each one of you with us this morning. We are glad that you got your get your clocks run forward and you made it out this morning. But we are thankful for the opportunity that we have and the day to be here. God's blessed us in, in many ways and allowed us to come out and worship and to celebrate and for that we're thankful this morning. I have a, a number of announcements. Let me start real quick. Uh, on the back of your bulletin you have an announcement at the bottom of it concerning our new uh, church directory. There is a QR code on the bottom of it. If you have a QR code reader on your smartphone, you can scan that, and that will take you to a spot of where you can register for uh, the, the time and the day you want to come to have your picture made. If you don't have a, a QR code reader, after church today, everybody that's on our prayer chain will get an email, and in that email there will be a link there you can click on, and it will take you to a spot of where you can register. The pictures are going to be made April the 15th through April the 18th. And you can go on there and you can pick the day and you can pick the time for you and your family to come by. When you set it up, you will be asked uh, to set up a, a username and a password. And the reason is, in case you want to buy pictures or in case you want to change your date if something comes up. So write that down when you uh, begin to register. And, and like I said, if you're unable to do it or you don't get an email today, please let us know. And you can sit down with me and we can walk through it and I can get you registered or whatever we need to do. So, but, but please be, be trying to do that. By, in a couple of weeks will be, the, uh, will be the last chance you'll get to register online. So try to have that done before the 20th gets here and uh, we'll get our new, uh, our new church bulletin up and going. There's a lot of folks here that, that you may not know and uh, you may see their face and recognize their face but don't know who they are. Through this new directory we'll be able to to maybe identify everybody just a little bit better. Let me announce tonight that we'll be having our, our chili and soup cook-off with our dessert auction. That'll be going on tonight. It starts at 6 o'clock in the Family Life Center. Uh, if you're bringing crock pots, Amy, you want to tell them if, uh, when, when do they need to get them here? Right. Yeah, so bring some dollar bills. You know, we, we kind of vote for the soup we like with our dollar bills. So, uh, so come tonight, even if, if you don't want to participate in the fundraiser and you just want to come, then you're more than welcome just to come and fellowship. We'd love to have you. Then after we do the soup and chili, we'll have our dessert auction tonight. So bring a dessert. We'll have a good time. It's always a lot of fun. It, it's always fun. Last year, you know, we, uh, uh, you know we, we raised money for the children's department during this. We, 
We have money budgeted for the children's department, but we raise this as extra, and this, with our budgeted amount, usually goes to fund the children's ministry for the rest of the year. And it, it's, it's always, we always have enough for what we need for the year, so, uh, so we're always appreciative of that, but, but come tonight for that. Let's see. Next Sunday night, starting at 6 o'clock in Skip Sunday School Room, I'm going to be leading a, a new membership class, and it goes for three weeks on Sunday night at 6 o'clock. And if you're thinking about being a member, or if you've recently joined, or if you've been a member for years and years and years, and just want to know more about the United Methodist Church and about Pleasant Hill, then you're more than welcome to come to that. The classes will last about an hour each night, and it'll be three nights. And we're going to talk about just the, the beliefs and the practices uh, and the doctrine of the Methodist Church. We're going to talk about the type of committees that Pleasant Hill have, has and uh, the way of which we function and the way things get done. So we, we will inform you to the best that we can. Uh, and that will go on starting next Sunday night at 6 o'clock in Skip Sunday School Room in the Family Life Center. And anyone that wants to participate in that, if you're debating it and just don't know anything about the Methodist Church, we'd love to have you. Uh, like I said, you're not locked in to join or anything if you just want to be uh, more informed and we're going to try to do this uh, maybe twice a year is what we're hoping to do if anybody wants to so if you miss it this time you can pick it up next time but that'll start next Sunday night any other announcements of any any kind board meeting tonight at 530 that's right before our soup and chili uh, cook off tonight we'll have a board meeting and that'll be in skip Sunday school room at 530 so those of you that are a part of that if you'd come to that, we'd greatly appreciate it. We've not been able to have one uh, this year because of just so many different things going on, but that'll be tonight. Any other announcement? Uh, choir practice. Okay. We're, we're trying to have choir practice on Wednesday nights after, after Bible study. Um, and Easter will be here before we know it. Right. So we're running out of time. Yeah, 1st of April is Easter, so that, that's about at 7 o'clock on Wednesday nights after our Bible study. Right. And on Wednesday nights right now, we have two more, two more weeks of Samson. So uh, if you're interested in that, we'd love to have you. And we'll be starting a new study after that. So we'll announce what it's going to be, hopefully next Sunday. What about a prayer request this morning? Yeah, Betty Hooks. We need to pray for Betty. If some of you know, some of you may not know that Betty fell uh, yesterday, I believe it was. Yesterday morning? Friday? Is that when it was? Friday morning. And uh, she has a broke shoulder and a broke hip, and uh, she is, they did surgery uh, when, Saturday, yesterday, I'm sorry, Friday, boy, all this is running together, they did, they did surgery Friday evening on her hip to repair that, uh, but, but she is in a lot of pain right now, she's at ECM, so please keep her and her family in your prayers when you pray. Any other prayer requests? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, Mike Walker, the Atkins family. Atkinson family lost. Okay, all right. Howard Rhodes, Nadine Vaughn. That's right. Friday, uh, the thirteenth, Evelyn's having surgery, having a knee replacement. So uh, we need to keep her and her family in your prayers when you pray. Okay. All right. Margaret. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, Kathy Moore is in my Sunday school class, and she has she has a brother named Eric Griffith. That he's a special needs young man, and uh, he had uh, multiple breaks in his neck, and it pretty much paralyzed him. The doctor said he'd probably never walk again, he'd lose all use of his limbs and everything, else. and so. Uh, but they did a surgery on him, and Kathy showed me a picture of him this morning that he is sitting up in the bed, waving with both hands, mm -hmm. and that he took nine steps this way. Right. Now, when you told you never walk again, one step is a miracle. That's right. But I'm telling you right now, he's had nine miracles this week because he's taken, he taken nine steps the doctor said he'd never take. That's great. And so I, I praise God for him. And, uh, you know, just continue to lift him up. He needs it. His name is Eric Griffin. Amen. Absolutely. That's right. Uh, listen, all the guys that come out Friday night to our men's thing, we, we are greatly appreciative of you coming out and participating in that. And 
Those of you that weren't able to come, you missed a blessing. I don't know if you know, but you know, Mr. Griffith is a mean shuffleboard player. <laughs> so uh, he's not here today. I was going to rib him a little bit. But we, we had a great time. We had a fun time. We're going to have some more of those events coming up. But uh, anybody else have anything? All right. What about unspoken prayer requests? Or any other praise reports of any kind? I'd rather hear praise reports than prayer requests. Right. He's clear. That's great. Wow. Sure will. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. All right. Thank you, Terry. Any other praise reports of any kind? All right. If you'll stand to your feet, let us bow our heads, and we'll go to the Lord in prayer and give thanks for these praise reports and. Uh, during this time, take this time to, uh, you know, whatever it is that's going on in your life, just talk to the Lord about it. Lay it down if it's too heavy. You know, we come in here with a lot of stuff. We carry a lot of stuff. And, uh, and so this morning, this, during this time of prayer, let me invite you to, to lay that stuff down and just set your heart and set your mind for a time of worship. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we thank you for the opportunity to gather together this Sunday morning. We thank you, Lord, for... Uh, the miracles that we get to hear about on a weekly basis. We thank you for the healings that are, that are currently going on and ones that have, uh, that have gone on. We give you praise for it, for we know that every good gift comes from you. And Lord, these that are sick or these that are hurt, uh, that are going through hard times and difficult situations right now, we ask that your hand would be upon them, that you would continue to bless them, and Lord, that you would just continue to be with them and give them strength, Lord, in times of weakness and in times of pain. And Father, for the unspoken requests, the things that go on in our hearts and things that we, that we carry around with us and we wrestle with in our mind, Lord, I pray that right now we lay those things down. We put our attention upon you and ask you, Lord, to guide us and lead us. Give us the strength, Lord, to make right decisions. Lord, as we turn our attention to you and lift up this worship to you, Father, we pray, Lord, that you're glorified this morning above all things. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. If you'll remain standing, we'll let the choir lead us in worship. Uh, read our affirmation of faith together. If you'll direct your attention to the screen, let us read. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated.
It is good uh, to have each one of you this morning. We are thankful that we've, had th- we've got this opportunity that God's blessed us with to come out and to, to worship and celebrate and to be with friends and family in the house of the Lord. And, you know, these, uh, th- these, these moments are, pro- are more special than I think we realize sometimes. You know, th- these opportunities are opportunities I believe we'll long for one day uh, when we're not, when we're, it's not as easy maybe to get to the house of the Lord and We'll look back at some of these times and wish we didn't maybe take some of them for granted, that we appreciated them and valued them for what they are because it is a blessing to be here. We let, we let the devil steal a lot of things from us, a lot of great opportunities. He, he steals, robs us of a lot of joy. Um, you know, he prevents us from seeing what it is that we're truly a part of and what's really going on in our life. And, uh, but, but this morning, I say that to say, it is a blessing to be here with each one of you. Uh, for it is a, always a, a great opportunity. This morning the sermon title is All in One. And uh, we're going to talk about one of the things that, that Christ did while he walked upon this earth. And it's one of those things that we don't talk about a whole lot. Uh, it's one of those things that often gets overlooked or overshadowed by some of the great miracles that Jesus did. And, and maybe this isn't seen as a, a great profound miracle that he did. But the truth be told, it, it may be one of the greatest miracles that he did uh, and we're going to talk about that as we make our way through it you know a few weeks back a couple of weeks ago we were in the living room there at the house and I was sitting there with Ruthie and Chloe and that the movie Titanic come on the uh, TV and uh, we were sitting there and we were watching it and it was it, was, it we picked it up where a lot was happening I think the, the the ship had just hit an iceberg and it was taking on water and it was about to go down and it was in the middle of sinking when we sit down and we began watching it and, uh, and so we, they, they kind of got enthralled with it. So they, they, uh, me and them two both, we just sat there and watched the whole thing all the way to the end. And it being on TV, it, it really has to be captivating to keep you through commercials and everything else. Uh, but we sat there through it. And when the commercials would come on, we'd get, I'd get just a, a plethora of questions from the two little girls. I mean, it was just one after the next. And, you know, of course, they would always ask. It seemed like every commercial break was, did this really happen? Did this really happen is what we kept uh, kept asking. There was one particular scene in it where they, if you remember the remember the movie, it's the ship's going down and everybody's trying to get to the top deck to get off the ship and they've got lifeboats and they're trying to get in what few lifeboats they have and um, and there's a scene in it of where uh, the, the the crew locks the gates that go down to the third class uh, to the third class area and, and it locked a bunch of third people that was in third class in, and it prevented them from getting up to the top. And they did this knowingly. They did it willingly. That as people were trying to get out, they locked the gates. And, and you know, and the question from the girls was, did that really happen? And, and I thought, well, I don't, I, you know, I don't know if that really happened or not, because they'll take stuff in uh, movies and they'll embellish it or they'll use it for, you know, this cinematic drama and... They'll take a lot of liberty with some of these true stories and add a lot to it. Well, I add a lot to it. That's not necessarily the case. And so I got to reading on it and done a little uh, investigating because I thought, well, surely, surely nobody would do that. Nobody would say. I mean, it's one thing to say you're third class and you can't eat with us, uh, or you're third class and you need to stay down there. But it's another thing to say you're third class and you can't be rescued with first class. You know, when the ship's going down, it just doesn't seem. Uh, uh, humane at all to lock people in the hull of a ship that's sinking. It just it doesn't seem humane in that regard at all, simply because of class. So I got to read and done a little research on it, and, and sure enough, th- it did happen. A lot of the gates that went down into third class were locked to prevent everybody or prevent the third class people from coming up on deck while they were trying to evacuate people that were in the first class. So so they they did they they did that. They they locked it up and. And I got to reading, and I don't have the exact numbers here in front of me, but it said, I, I believe there were 200 and something first class passengers, and out of the 270 or so, I think 64% of those passengers survived. There were over 300 second class passengers, and out of that group, I want to say 46% of that group survived. And of third class, there was over 700 passengers third class, and there was only 24% of third class passengers survived. Only one in four survived while more than half of first class passengers survived. And, and as I was watching that and got to thinking about it, it, 
it's amazing that, as I said earlier, they would take and they would lock the gates down that goes down into third class because they will not let the people of third class come up to the upper deck and be rescued at the same time people of first class was being rescued. And, and as I was thinking about that, and uh, there's a lot of stories that Jesus tells that talks about the way God views people as the same. You know, there's not first class, not second class, and not third class. And it seems like all through humanity since the dawn of time, we have gotten very good at classifying people. You know, we, we determine people's value and people's worth, and we would make a declaration that they are better or worth more or more valuable than these people or these people. And then we start classifying people. We've always done it. Humanity's always done this, even to the point to where it seems so normal for us to do it. It seems so natural, you know, for us to do it. We even do it sometimes without thinking or without realizing, you know, what's going on or what we're doing. Amy and I watch this show, and some of you may watch it. It's, uh, that, it's Downton Abbey. Has anybody ever watched that? You ever see that show? Anybody? Nobody watches Downton Abbey. You watch Downton Abbey. Anybody? Hmm. Anyway, uh, as, you know, I realize it's not the most invigorating show, but I thought somebody surely had seen it besides us. Anyway, it's on PBS is what it's on, and, and Downton Abbey is, it's set back in 1921 through 1925. It's somewhere in that time period, and it's an old Yorkshire estate. It's a, it's a uh, you know, a fictional York, Yorkshire estate that is, uh, the, the family name is the Crawleys, is the family name, and... Uh, and, and the whole thing is set up about class, about the class system. It was back during the time when the aristocrats were, you know, uh, important folks, and there was this hierarchy of class people. And, and you know, in the, in the house there at Downton Abbey, this huge estate, the, the family sits down for a meal, and when the family sits down for a meal, there's only a very few other people that are privileged enough to sit down with them at the table and eat with them. A lot of the people, the, even the servants, they're not even allowed inside the room when they're eating. And there's some people that are within the town uh, that the house is in that can't even come to the house. And if they do come to the house, they can't come up to the place of where they eat or come in certain areas. There's common areas and, you know, and then there's special areas. And, and the whole show is about this, this class system. There's the upper class, the middle class and the lower class, and where everybody fits into that. And what's so interesting about the show is, it's so normal to them. It, nobody thinks it's odd at all. They don't think it's odd that, that although they have been created by the exact same God, in the image of God, it is not odd at all for them to think, I'm not as valuable as that person. Or, they're, or I'm more valuable than that person. It's just... It's assumed and it's taken as given fact and everybody plugs on about their way. Every now and then on the show, you'll have a little rebel that'll come through that'll try to, you know, say that something's not right about this system, but they get shoved off to the back and everybody goes into their normal routine. One of the shows where the, the, the house almost melted down was when one of the girls, uh, one of the, the Crawley girls had decided to get a job and was going to hold down a job. And the whole family comes apart because the upper class aristocrats did not have jobs. That was for lower class and middle class people. And, and then the whole country just about fell apart when one of the daughters decided to marry the chauffeur. I mean, you know, it was, it's, it's, such, it's so odd because, you know, sitting back watching it unfold, it, it's just so commonplace that there were these classes and there was these people. But, but there again, ever since humanity broke in the Garden of Eden, the Old Testament is about people over here and people over there and they don't belong with this people and they don't belong with that people. So ever since the dawn of mankind, we have been putting people in classification, classification, declaring some to be more than others, some to be more valuable or worth more or deserving of more than other people are. And one of the things that Jesus does as he walks upon this earth is he tears down those walls, those barriers that was separating people. You know, those walls that said, you can't be with these people because you're not fit. You know, the walls that would tell people, you can't come into the, to the house of worship because you're unclean or you're unfit or you're unrighteous or you can't sit at the table with these particular people because 
you're not fit to be at the table with them. And the thing that upset, or that, that Jesus upset in their life more than anything else, it was this social class system. I mean, it was one thing for him to declare himself to be the Messiah, but it was something completely different for him to really upset the social environment that they were living in, and that's what he did. Because here Jesus was claiming to be the Messiah or the Son of God and, and in a very righteous position uh, and as one that was teaching and one that was leading and one that was doing miracles and would talk about God and would, would talk about the things of God. But he was also one who was running around with sinners and, you know, and in his inner circle there were, there were uh, you know, nasty shepherds and some of his closest ones had been prostitutes before. And, and here this religious man was not only knowing people of the, that the whole town knew was unrighteous, but was close to these people that the town declared to be unrighteous. And so Jesus really begins to tear down these barriers, and He begins to bring God close to people who thought they could not be close to God. And the reason they felt like they couldn't be close to God is because of this value system that was set up. Some were very valuable, some were very... Were uh, not valuable at all. Some were pushed to the outskirts of the city, while some were protected on the inside, in the innermost parts of the city. You know, some were looked at with awe, and some were looked down upon. But, but what's odd is nobody, nobody found that to be odd. Even the people who were looked down upon knew and believed they were of less value than those who were righteous. They didn't fight that for the most part. They didn't cause a ruckus or they didn't resist that. They understood that to be their lot. Just like those who were declared to be more valuable, it was nothing for them to literally and legitimately believe they were better than somebody else. And that's been passed down. I believe it's something in our, just, it, it's innate within us to start valuing people and start classifying people and deciding who we're more valuable than, or deciding who's more valuable than we are. And it begins to work its way into our spiritual life, and it really becomes a problem. Because what Jesus did is He breaks that stuff down. And He makes all of us one in Him before the Father. Everybody that's accepted Christ and has come to Jesus as a, as a sinner and confessed their sins and accepted Him as Lord and Savior stands before the Father covered by the Son. Everybody. And that's the value that you and I have. That's our identity. That, it, <coughs> excuse me. It's not what class we belong to in this world or who thinks we're valuable or who don't think we're valuable. That has nothing to do with it. Our identity is in how the Father sees us. And when He looks at us, He doesn't see worldly classifications, but He sees the Son. It's what He sees. And it makes my value and your value one in Christ Jesus. But like I said, we, we are tempted to try to put people in classifications. There's a story here in the Bible. I'm going to read to you. Here's a passage of it I'm going to read. Well, I, let me take that back. Let me read you a passage out of Galatians first before we get into the story. And this passage in Galatians really summarizes it. And you can find this particular scripture in more places than just one because it's such a radical statement that this may have been what upset the people more than Jesus claiming to be God was this statement. Listen to what, as, as Paul begins to talk about the ministry of Jesus, he says, For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise? So Paul is essentially saying that there is none greater or lesser when it comes to the, to the Father who has put on Jesus. If you and I have put on Christ, then it means when the Father sees us, He sees His Son. And it doesn't mean that the men are better than the women or that the Jews are better than the Greek or that the free are better than the slave in the eyes of the Father. For you've all been baptized into Christ and you have put on Christ and before the Father, you are one. Jesus works to establish this and tears down the big eyes and the little U's. He works to establish this and to bring these people together through His work on the cross and to unify these wonderful creations that God has made in His image and get away from the I'm better, you're better, you sit there, I sit here, 
because this is how it works. There's a story in the New Testament where Jesus is invited to a meal by a Pharisee. And a Pharisee, of course, was a very religious man. And he studied the law and he knew the law very well. And the people saw him as a very religious man and a very pious man. Well, Jesus is invited to this man's house. Well, Jesus comes in and he sits down at the table to share a meal with this, uh, with this Pharisee. And basically the whole town is outside watching what's going to happen because here Jesus is. He runs around with sinners and he rubs elbows with the unrighteous people. And like I said, he's got smelly shepherds as his disciples. He's got uh, recovering prostitutes as those that are in his inner circle. And he's got all of these people that this Pharisee would never in a million years be around. Well, that's, that's, the kind of, that's a big part of the people that were following Jesus. Now they've invited Jesus in, and they're sitting at the table together. And while they're sitting at the table together, a woman busts in this meeting between these two men. A woman busts in, and she has an alabaster box in her hand. And she comes in there, and she breaks that alabaster box open. And she gets out this, this nice-smelling ointment, and she pours it over Jesus. And while she's there, not only does she do that, but the Bible says that she washes his feet with her tears, and she dries his feet with her hair. She's worshiping him in this moment. But there in that moment, here's what you've got. You've got a woman who is declared to be a sinner by the entire community. You have a Pharisee who is a religious man, and if any could be righteous, it would be him that is seen by the community. And you had Jesus in the middle of them. That's what you've got. And this is what Jesus has done. Jesus has, through his work on the cross, has broken down all those barriers and brought all those people together in him. And let me tell you, a lot of people do not like that. They didn't like it then, and the truth of the matter is, a lot of people don't like it today either. But this is what Christ did. And I want you to read, listen to this passage here. It's in Luke 7 and 39. Here's what the Pharisee says. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner. Now, can you see what the Pharisee is declaring? The Pharisee is declaring that he is better than this woman because this woman is a sinner and he is not. Right? So, obviously, if this woman's a sinner and he's not, then he must be of more value to this woman. This woman does not belong in his house. He does not, she does not belong at his table. And she certainly should not be in a place of where she's touching religious people of any shape, form, or fashion. And so he says, if he's really a prophet and he really knows all of this, he ought to know that this woman is a sinner. Well, Jesus does know this woman's a sinner. He knows that the Pharisee's a sinner, and he knows that everybody else around him at that particular time was a sinner as well. And that's what he did. He came to break down those barriers that divided people and that separated people and caused us to, to divide and separate ourselves. And so Jesus comes in the middle of that, and he begins to, to bring this stuff together, which ultimately led him to the cross where he was crucified, and on the third day he rose again. But the lesson that we have today, more than anything else, is that when the Father looks at us, He doesn't see the sinful woman that is sitting there that has all these terrible things in her past. He doesn't see the self-righteous Pharisee who thought he had it all together. But for those who have been baptized into Christ, He doesn't see the Pharisee, He doesn't see the sinner. He sees His Son. So if Jesus looks at me and sees His Son, and looks at you and sees His Son, then I would say we are one in Him. I would go as far to say that we hold the same value to Him, is what I would say. I, I wouldn't say that because I stand up here and preach on Sunday morning that I'm of more value than you are. You know, and or what I say is since Harold's been in church for many more years than I've been in church, could I say that Harold is more valuable than I am because of the years that he's been in church? But I can say that when he sees me, he sees his son. And when he sees Harold, he sees his son. And when he sees Amy, he sees his child. When he sees us, that's what he sees is the righteousness of his son, which makes all of us one together. Now, I believe that Jesus paid an extremely uh, high price so that we could all be united together in him uh, in his, in his name and the righteousness that he offers, I believe it breaks his heart when we divide ourselves again. I believe it does. I mean, he, he paid an awful lot so there wouldn't be any big eyes and little U's in the kingdom of God. He paid an awful steep price so that people wouldn't declare themselves to be better than somebody else or less than somebody else. He's paid an awful big price so that the Pharisee and the sinner can be seen the same in the eyes of God. 
that the person who comes into church has had a terrible past, the person who comes in here and gives their heart to Christ, and let's say in their past they've had terrible relationships that have fallen apart, in their past they've made terrible decisions, or in their past they've, got, they've had terrible addictions, or whatever it might be, Christ has paid an awful big price so that you can come in here on Sunday morning, you can accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, and say, I am of no less value than anybody else in this room. Anybody else in this room. And he paid that price for the self-righteous. He paid that price for that. And listen, the devil works so hard to convince people because of your past, you couldn't possibly be as valuable as everybody else around you. Because of your past and what you've been through or because of the type of home that you were raised in or because of some traumatic experience that's happened in your life that you've been tainted and you've been scarred to the point of where you couldn't possibly be as valuable as those who have not been scarred like you have. And the devil convinces people of that and they begin going through their spiritual journey believing they are of less value to God than other people are. There's a temptation within us to make those declarations and allow ourselves. Like I said, the, the oddest thing to me about that Downton Abbey show was that everybody goes about their business and don't give it a second thought that they're lower class or that they think they're better than somebody else. You know, I, I went to, when I was working for uh, Ford Credit, I, I flew to Dearborn, Michigan, uh, I don't know, half a dozen times, and it's odd. I mean, as I was getting on the plane, you know, with one particular plane that I loaded, you would kind of step on into first class and then you would just step back into second class and I'd never give it a second thought that there are people in this plane that have paid more money so they don't have to sit by me. <laughs> it never occurred to me. I mean, that literally, there are people in this plane riding with us that have paid more money so they don't have to sit beside me. Never occurred to me, and I just marched on my way with a nice head nod, found my seat, and just hoped the plane wouldn't go down, you know, for the most part. And, but but it's, it's so innate within us. It's been passed down to us so many generations. A lot of times we never give it a second thought. We never realize what's happening. You know, and because of that, we fail to realize the price that Jesus paid to overcome these, these class barriers, these divisions that are there. There's another story in the, uh, in the New Testament that Jesus tells. It's a story about the prodigal son. And the prodigal son, he tells us about this son who wants all of his inheritance so he can go live any way he wants to. His father gives him his inheritance. He leaves home. He goes out into the world, has a good time. He wastes all of his inheritance. He loses all of it, ends up in a famine, and now he's eating with the pigs that he's supposed to be feeding. He didn't have anything. He had lost everything. The Bible says that in that moment, in Luke 7, it says that he come to himself and he realized that I can go back to my house as a, back to my father's house as a servant and at least he will give me something decent to eat. Now why do you think this boy felt like he couldn't go back as a son? He, he, he doesn't. He feels like because of his past and because of the bad decisions that he's made and because of the way that he's hurt his father, he has to come back as a servant. He can't come back as a son. But on his way back, as he gets closer to the house, the Bible says that the father looks up and sees him coming, said he runs to him, said he grabs him up, he kisses him on the cheek, he puts a ring on his finger, he begins to clothe him with nice clothes and nice raiment, he kills the fatted calf and has a great meal for him because according to the father, his son that was lost had come home. This boy was coming back into his father's house feeling like he was unworthy to be the father's son because of the things that he had done. He felt like he was unworthy to be the father's son because he had made bad decisions. He had wasted his money and he had turned his back on his family. All of this stuff he felt like had made him less valuable to the father. And so the father brings him back in, not as a servant. He brings him back in as a son. He puts a robe around him. They have a party. He says, my son that was dead uh, is now alive. He that was lost has been found. Well, you guess who's upset? The other son in the house, right? How can he come back like a son and he's done all these terrible things? I've been with you all of this time. I've never run out on you. I've never disappointed you like this. I've always been faithful to you. I've been here when he wasn't here. How can he come back in as a son and I'll be a son too? It's innate. It's within us to declare ourselves to be of more value than other people are. But the Father's Take him back by it. He says, this is your brother that's come home. We need to be celebrating this. Listen to this exchange here. 
Luke, in Luke uh, 15 and 27. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he had received him safe and sound. And he was angry, and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. The Bible says the older brother within the house was upset that the father had taken back the son, and the son had come back. Listen, I, I believe this is uh, it's a great story on so many different levels. But one of the things it does teach us is that in Christ, to the Father, we are one. Do you know that when you, when you come in, you don't come in as a second-class Christian because you don't have religious learnings in your past. You don't come in as a second-class Christian because you've had bad experiences out there or because bad things have happened. Or better yet, you don't come in as a second-class Christian just because you can't quote half the Bible. You come in, when you begin born again and you give heart, your heart to Christ and He covers you with the, with the blood and you come in as a, as a first-class believer just like everybody else. Just like everybody else. I can pick out many of people and, and make comparisons to from me and Renee. I'm sure Renee's past is very different than my past. I'm sure that when I come to the faith, it's very different maybe than the way that she came to the faith. Maybe at different times and different places in her life. I come to the faith at nine years old and been on this journey some 31 years now trying to figure out what's right, what's wrong, what's God want me to do, what's this happening, what's that happening. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Renee was pretty much an adult when she made a full commitment to Christ and to give her heart to Christ. And, and so odds are I may have been on this journey uh, a little bit longer than she has, but God doesn't view me as more valuable than, than her. Because the truth is we were the same before we came to Christ. We were sinners before we came to Christ. It doesn't matter what her past was. It doesn't matter what decisions might be there. She was a sinner and I was a sinner. And we were both estranged from our Heavenly Father. But when we come to Christ and we get washed under the blood of Christ, we both once again become the same in Christ. For when Jesus looks at me, He sees His Son. And when He looks at her, He sees Christ that she has put on. So in His eyes... Regardless of her decisions in the past, and regardless of, of when I give my heart to Christ, we are one in Christ, in His eyes. James says it in a wonderful way. Listen to the way he describes it here in our last passage. James 2 verse 1 says, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place and say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool. You have, you, uh, have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? He says, if you show partiality in any way concerning things of the faith, he says you've taken a step that you were not supposed to take. You have taken on a responsibility that does not belong to you. So let me ask you, if, if when the father looks at me, or, let's, or Renee, if the father looks at Renee and sees his righteous son when he looks at her, and if you or I declare that she's not worthy to sit on the front row and she needs to go to the back row, who essentially are you saying is not worth sitting on the front row? Jesus. That's what you're saying. When you decide that she's not valuable enough or worthy enough to be within your circle, or she's not valuable enough or worthy enough for this attention or that attention or any attention, essentially in the eyes of God, you're not casting Renee out, but you're casting his son out. Because when he sees her, that's what he sees. When he sees me, that's what he sees. So what does it say when, he, when James says, Do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Listen, this morning Christ paid an awful big sin an awful big price so that you and I could be one together in Him. And like I said, I believe it breaks His heart when we begin to divide ourselves and make these declarations that it's not our responsibility to make whatsoever. And i got to tell you, these, the stories that I read to you this morning, they may be old stories, and you may have heard them hundreds of times as far as the prodigal son goes and the, the woman with the alabaster box. You may have heard these stories but this is a very real contemporary problem that we deal with today. 
And, 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 and listen, hear me when I say this. I'm not up here throwing rocks at people saying, you shouldn't think you're better than anybody. I'm up here saying that within us, there is something about our brokenness that wants to do this. There is something about us that, that wants to take the step, either consciously or unconsciously at times, of trying to place more value on some people than other people. I'm saying today that we need to be aware that those who have been bought by the blood of Christ and, and those who have professed their faith in Jesus, that we are one in Christ Jesus. And we need to make a conscious effort to make sure we practice what we believe. If you believe that's the case, you need to practice that with the people around you. If you believe that's the case, then you need to live that out every day of your life, saying that in the eyes of Christ, we are one together. Jan, if you want to come to the piano for me this morning, listen, I know I, I, you know, I don't think anybody would ever be comfortable in saying, you know, I do, I, I have a tendency to think I'm better than people. I don't think anybody's going to make that type of confession whatsoever. But I will say this. I think you have to consciously decide you're not going to go down that road. And the reason I say that is because it, it, it's such a sneaky attack by Satan that things that we almost feel as normal can be very detrimental to our journey. I mean, it, it was normal, you know, when, uh, years ago in that aristocrat system for people to openly declare themselves to be of more worth as a person than somebody else. And it was clearly acceptable. Now, that's a thousand years after Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again to make people valuable to, uh, in one and through Christ Jesus. And they're still wrestling with it then. We still very much wrestle with it today as well. It's a very real contemporary problem today. So this morning, we're going to invite you to pray. Whatever it is you want to pray about in whatever capacity you want to pray about it. But I'm guessing if you deal with this, then it is a very real challenge for people you work with, for family members, or even people we go to church with. I'm guessing that it's a very real challenge for you just to throw this off and move on about your business. We're going to have to have the power of Christ to help us out. So if you'll stand to your feet, I'm going to have a word of prayer. Then we'll invite you to come pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time together. We thank you, Father, for what you have done for us. Lord, the way of which you have brought us into your family and the way that you value us. Lord, we know that had we been the only ones on this earth, that you would have still given your Son for us. Father, I pray that each one of us here today becomes better at practicing what we believe in our faith. That, that we become better keeping those walls torn down instead of rebuilding them and dividing people. God, thank you so much for caring for us and loving us enough to give us a path to righteousness. Father, we ask Lord, that your spirit would move right now, that you would touch the hearts of the people that are here today. Uh, you know what they're dealing with. You know what they're wrestling with. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As she plays, I invite you to come pray. What